I was born and raised in San Diego, Califaslan. Both my parents are Mexican. In our home, we spoke Spanish, did all the traditional things you do in a Mexican Catholic home. When we stepped outside the door, we spoke English so that others could see we were assim assimilating to American society. Border town children living in two worlds, praying in Spanish and pledging allegiance in English. In first grade, the counselor advised my mother, just a second. In first grade, the counselor advised my mother not to put me in a bilingual class because it would ruin my English accent. My mother agreed. She felt it would further my opportunities for success, and she knew I would learn Spanish at home. I didn't understand why Spanish, my native tongue, was something that could threaten my English. I did learn to read and write Spanish at home, on my own, picking up the only familiar book in our home, the Bible. In elementary school, I was the proudest American, not just Mexican-American, but American. I was so proud that when I went to go visit my grandmother in Tijuana, I would purposely speak English so that, so that the Tijuanenses knew I wasn't Mexican, I was American. I felt that my speaking English made me better. I don't know why that is. But I do remember hearing the pride in my parents' voice when they shared the fact that we lived del otro lado, on the other side. Kids in Tijuana were mesmerized by my English and by the stories of el otro lado. The kids would ask what San Diego was like. Are the streets made of gold? No. I would simply have to say the streets are clean and paved, and that was enough. Both my parents had a rough upbringing. They made it to a sixth grade education level before they had to go work to help their family survive. Being in San Diego was everything. Living just five miles north of the border from Tijuana meant that my sister, brother, and I would have a different experience than they had. We were in the land of opportunity. Look at me in my perfect English, a true example of America. The education system was the process to my assimilation, making me a patriot for this country. I would happily skip to Yankee Doodle and knew all the words to America the Beautiful. I love the idea of a melting pot in the United States. Someday there would be no such thing as color and we would all just melt into each other. I was taught everyone was equal. I was a part of the sleeping giant. I went on to junior high and noticed a few things were different. My melting pot friends didn't want to melt with me. The Mexicans were with the Mexicans, the whites with the whites, and so on. Okay. I hung with my own, the other brown teens. After all, we looked alike, dressed alike, spoke some Spanish, were bussed in from the barrio. It made sense on the outside, but I knew it was segregation. It confused me. It shook my core so hard that I began to look for other signs. That same year, I made a French pen pal. When the teacher asked us to mail our photo, I did. And then the French girl stopped writing me. Months later, she wrote back and told me that she expected to have an American pen pal. She said, I thought you were going to have blonde hair and blue eyes. What? I didn't know that American meant I had to be white. This experience did away with the melting pot theory. I realized people looked at me. When they looked at me, they didn't think that American girl. They were thinking that Mexican girl. All this time, my father would say, you can do anything those gringas can do. And more, because you're bilingual, you have the same opportunity. But I was left feeling like, do I? Or are other people judging me based on the color of my skin? My big brown eyes were wide open, enough to see that it wasn't just a French girl. It was everyone in my world. They had certain expectations of a young teenage Mexican girl, and they weren't high expectations. They were at-risk youth statistics. You should join a club. You should play a sport. Statistics show you could end up pregnant at any moment. <laughs> I was awake. I could finally see you. I could finally see me. In eighth grade, I encountered the only Mexican woman I had seen in my education, in my, education my counselor, Ms. Barrios. Are you Mexican, I asked. It was obvious she was Mexican, but I had to test her. And she said, no. I'm not. 
I am Chicana. What is that? I asked. Chicana, another word for Mexican American, a person who is politically involved in their community. Oh, I could be that. It felt better than any other label I had come across. Ms. Barrios, she must know what she's talking about. She's educated and of Mexican descent. My search began. I was curious, intrigued. I saw opportunity to do more and to be more. Ms. Barrios, she was a different kind of statistic. I wanted that. She, that person who was leading by example and sharing her knowledge and love for Chicano culture, redirected my life into a path of wanting to contribute to something bigger than myself, the movement. I looked beyond history lessons and I began to uncover massive roots. I was only in middle school, so my resources were limited. What I found was that I was standing on my own land and those roots went on for miles and miles all the way to my mother's birthplace, the Nochitlan, Mexico City. I didn't have to assimilate. I had my own birthright as a descendant of the cosmic, cosmic race. And let me take it even one step further. I realized that the blood that pumps, pumps through this body, the DNA that is responsible for my indigenous features will always be mestiza. Oh, I was awake. I wasn't just awake, I was ready for what came next. My intuition, my higher self, my spiritual guide kicked in. I was inspired to create. I started painting, depicting all the many shades of brownness I could onto my canvas. I searched for art that represented my culture. It was rare to find, so I created it for myself. I researched books, people. I asked bigger questions. I dug up my family tree. I found more brown faces looking back at me, speaking to me, showing me how to rise. The spiritual messages kept coming. I kept listening, and my eyes were wide open. It wasn't until I went on to take a Chicano Studies course at City College that I learned I was privileged enough to further my knowledge. Yes, Chicano history, my history, is a privilege in this country. I was taking courses that many of my friends who did not graduate high school would never get to take. And that's not fair. Our history has been absent. I am one of many Mexican women. How will any other child or peer ever feel empowered by her roots, the color of her skin, if she can't identify with the sheroes? I decided that I'm going to change that, at least in the world I can directly impact. I am determined to leave a legacy. I decided to open a private lending Chicano library called Aslan Consciente. And I continue to paint art that is relevant to my culture and empowerment for myself and for others. I have painted at Chicano Park and have worked on community public art projects with people of different cultures. We should all feel empowered. My vision statement. To use resources of knowledge and wisdom to strengthen the Chicano Chicana movement and manifest a free Aslan. To facilitate the access of literature for everyday Chicanos, Chicanas living under any circumstance. To plant seeds of culture, consciousness, activism, and support Chicanos, Chicanas in their contribution to free oppressed minds. I want my children, Raquel and Pedro Joaquin, to always feel free to stand in their own truth. Their blood and roots, like mine and their fathers, will always be Mexican. Their skin will always be brown. I want them to be awake. Why doesn't someone wake us all up? I woke up just in time to be there for my internal revolution and evolution, but I almost missed it. Thank you. It was Patricia Aguayo.